We're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It says there, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Let's pray. Lord, we come to You asking You to help us, teach us, Lord. Help us be diligent in our prayer, diligent in seeking You. I pray, Lord, You'd teach us during this time. And God, use us. I pray you fill us with your spirit. You use us to build your kingdom. God, help us, please. We need you. Help us to realize that we need you. That without you, we could do nothing. We always need you. There's never a time we don't need you. Help us to realize that. I'm afraid all of us are so guilty of just, we're so self-reliant that we forget that we need you, that we couldn't even be here without you if you didn't sustain us. God, help us to confess our sin even right now in our own heads. God, forgive us. Lord, help us to repent and turn from those things and to really just come to you humbly, trusting you. Please bless this time, the preaching of your word. Lord, use me, fill me with your spirit. Amen. So disciples' diligent approach to prayer. In this short passage right here we just read, those, you know, four or five verses, whatever it is, five verses there, the Lord gives us the key to living out the high and lofty commands of the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, if you go through the Sermon on the Mount, there's some, some hard things that are, or that are said in there that we are to, to live up to. If you go back to chapter 5, verse Three, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Um, Verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I mean, verse 11, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. I mean, who says that's easy? Who can live up to that? I mean, you get over to uh, still chapter 5 and go to verse 22. It says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. I mean, just having the wrong attitude towards somebody and and it's hellfire. I mean, who can live up to these stands and uh, these commands right here? Over in verse 28 it says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Who can live up to these commands? How can we live up to these commands? We get to... Verse 39, But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Not seeking vengeance. Who doesn't want to seek vengeance when when something bad or evil happens to us? Who doesn't? Isn't that our first instinct? How can we live up to these commands? And I'm telling you right here in in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, God gives us the key to doing that. And He simply says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He says, ask, ask me, ask me as I've gone through all of this and I'm teaching you these things and Jesus is here giving this sermon as we call it the Sermon on the Mount and he's there uh, giving this sermon out to them and he tells them, here's the key to it, ask, ask. So the key is to earnestly ask God for help. That's what we need to do, but we, we so often lose sight of that. We forget to ask God for help and we try and do it in our own power, even the most Simple things, the most mundane things that, oh, well, we, I'm okay with this. I got this, God. You just handle the big stuff. But we don't let Him, and we need to let Him handle even all the small things and the big things. Yet one of the major discouragements when praying, when praying is that we seemingly don't see our prayers answered. And that discourages people. And I say we seemingly don't see our prayers answered. But that's not the impression at all that the Lord gives in this passage. 
that your prayer won't be answered. He says, ask and it shall be given you. I mean, he's saying, ask me, it's going to be given to you. It's the exact opposite. But what he does encourage here is diligent prayer or asking. Diligently coming to him. I mean, look, it's ask, it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I mean, go after it. Go get it is what God is saying. Seek my face. That's what we have to do. See, we want a simple one, two, three, and, and the answer comes. I mean, it's just that simple, but that's not what God says we're to do. He says we're to diligently seek after him. Ask, seek, knock. I'm going after him. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop because I didn't get the answer as soon as I wanted it. But I'm going to diligently seek him. See, part of our diligence in prayer is that it brings us closer to the Lord. This whole story here, as we're reading, as Jesus is telling it, he likens it to a father and a son relationship. And, you know, the more the child seeks something from the father, the closer the two of them get. That's what God's saying. He's like, this is what I want from it. It's not just that we get our prayers answered. It's that also that we get closer to the father. That's the goal of it. That's really what he ultimately wants. God will not withhold anything good from us if we are diligently asking, seeking, and knocking at His door. He's not going to keep anything from us if we're diligently asking, seeking, and knocking at His door. It is a result of His goodness that He wants to give to us, reveal things to us, and open doors for us. The question is, are we diligently going to seek Him for the answer? That's where most of us fall off. We, we do it for a bit and then we just fall off and we forget about it. That's why something like the prayer list is so important because it reminds us to ask for these things. Before this exhortation to prayer is given though, Jesus first challenges His followers to judge and deal with their own sin first. That's verses 1 through 6. We looked at that. Judge not that ye be not judged. But what does He say? He says, hey, look at yourself first. Get the, the, moat out, the beam out of your own eye first so you can see... Uh, the, the moat that is in thy brother's eye, the little splinter in your brother's eye. He says, deal with your own sin first. And that's so often, even Christians, we talk about the lost. They don't want to admit their lost condition. Well, hey, uh, many Christians don't want to admit their sinful condition. They're not willing to admit that. But that's the first step. If we want to see uh, God answer our prayers, if we want to see revival take place in this city, in this nation, in this state, whatever it is in our church, in the midst of right here, then we have to first... Deal with our own sin and answer for our own sin. We have to. That's what Christ dealt with first. And then he says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Once we've confessed our sin and gotten our hearts right, then we start asking. And if we're diligent in seeking God for things, he's going to give things to us, reveal things to us, and open doors for us. That's what he said. He said, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. So if we're diligent in seeking Him, He's going to give the things to us. He's going to reveal things to us and He's going to open doors for us. These are not hope so commands, but promises from God. God promised it. God's first going to give us the things that we ask. It says there, ask and it shall be given you. Verse 8, for everyone that asketh receiveth. You know, a parent doesn't always give the exact thing that we ask for. But usually the better thing. Even a parent's no is many times a better thing. Kids don't know what they need and what's best for them. I mean, if we let them, they'd eat ice cream all day and candy and junk food. I mean, that's what they would do if we'd let them. So they say, can we have this? We say no. But we give them something. Here, this is better. We give them that. They might not think so, but isn't that true? Isn't it better? Yet, yet they need it. If they want to grow to be healthy and strong and not have diabetes at age 8, I mean, they need that stuff. The better. So just because God doesn't give us exactly what we ask for, see, it says, as we go through here, it says He's going to give us the good things. Verse 11, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? See, God's going to give us good things. He'll give us the better thing. The things that we ask for need to be in submission to His will and asked in faith. That's implied in this. Ask and it shall be given you. I mean, there's some requirements to, to prayer. Uh, James says that you have not because you ask not, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. God says, no, that's not good for you. 
He says, I'll give you good things. I'm not going to give you that. What you're asking for is not good for you. It will destroy you. People say, Lord, I just want $2 million. You can't handle $200. If I give you $2 million, you'll kill yourself. Okay, so no. The answer, that's not good for you. God's not going to give us things that are going to hurt us. They have to be in submission to His will and asked in faith. You know, sometimes when we get down to, to praying for something, have we even asked God, God, what, what do you want me to pray for? Because I don't know exactly what I need to pray for. Lord, you show me what's going to be best in this thing. Lord, you guide me in this. Let him lead in the whole thing. He knows what we need, doesn't he? So maybe we should ask him, Lord, you show me what I should be asking for here. Does that sound weird? I, I hope it doesn't. I mean, it would rejoice my heart if my kids came and said, Hey, Dad, what do you think about this? What should I do in this situation? Wouldn't that rejoice your hearts as parents? What should I do in this situation? You'd say, I'm glad you asked. Here, let me point you in the right direction. And you're going to have to make the decision, but here's, here's some thoughts on that. God is next going to reveal truth to us if we're seeking Him. All right, it says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. So he's gonna, he says, you're going to find it all. I'll reveal it to you if you are first seeking it out. You have to go after it. So God's, I mean, we think that just we pray and it's just, bam, I get it. It's like praying, Lord, give me a job. Well, have you applied for any? Well, no. Well, how do you think you're going to get one? Yes, I'm not saying he can't just give you a job without you applying for it. I know there's been circumstances like that. I've seen it happen. But look, for the most part, we better put some feet to our prayers. What most people want to do, especially in our microwave society, is we just want to say, well, I asked for it and he'll give it to me. Where is it? And we want to put no effort into it. Well, he says, seek. I mean, that, you ever played hide and go seek? I mean, when you're the seeker, you, you count to 100 or whatever, and then... You know, the cheaters would just like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and they're coming after you. But hey, anyway, you know, they, they, they you hide and go seek. Everyone goes and hides, and what's the seeker do? They just stand there and say, hey, everyone come out so I can find you. No, they have to put in some work. They have to go look for them, search for them. And then once they find them, they've got to chase them down, right? And they've got to get them. There's work in that, and that's what God's saying. Seek and ye shall find. So go after it. Go look for it. And, and what's really, what should we be looking for as far as... Coming to God in prayer. What's the main thing that we need? I, well, I'd like to say that it's wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. That's what uh, Proverbs says. That wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, with all thy getting, get wisdom. In Proverbs 8, 10, and 11, it says, Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may de be desired are not to be compared to it. To what? To wisdom. Most, most of us think... Even it infects our thinking. Well, if I just had some more money, it could fix some of these problems that I had. And maybe that's true in some instances. It might be able to, but that's not the main thing. That's not really what's going to help us. Maybe if I had some wisdom, I wouldn't have put myself in a situation where I'd need this money to get out of these circumstances. See, that's why wisdom's better than rubies. Because if you get rubies, you can get yourself back in that bad situation or make it worse even, if you get that gold and stuff, you can make the situation worse. But if you had some wisdom, then you'd know how to get out of the situation. And then you can say, well, I don't want to get back in that. And you've got wisdom to stay out of that situation. See, that's why wisdom's the better thing. That's why we need wisdom. That's why I believe that's what we need to ask for. We need to seek after wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is seeing things through God's eyes. Wisdom is seeing things how God sees them. That's what we need. That's what I want. Lord, show me. Let me see things like you see them. I mean, I want to be like you were when, when Moses was up on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights and God sees what the children of Israel are doing and He says, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. And Moses says, no, no, don't do it, Lord, don't. And Moses intercedes and stops him. But man, I want to see things how God sees them. I want to see sin as exceeding sinful like God sees it. I don't want to justify my sin and think that it's okay because, well, yeah, we're, we're all sinners. I don't want to do that. I want to see it as just something awful and filthy and just get it off me. Oh, it's just, get off. That's, I want to see it like God sees it. Where God had Jesus on the cross and he's there dying on the cross, bearing the weight of our sin. And the Lord forsakes him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's how I want to see my own sin, where I'd forsake it. 
Or I just turn my back on it. It's disgusting to me. It's filthy. It's vile. That's what I want. Wisdom. I want to see it how God sees it. It goes on to say in Proverbs chapter 8, talking about wisdom. Wisdom's personified. says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Man, can we pray for our kids? Can we pray for our kids to seek wisdom early? To seek God early? Because it says, and they, those that seek me early shall find me. And I want my kids to follow after wisdom. I want to follow after wisdom, so let's seek after wisdom. It says, those that seek me early shall find me. Are we seeking after wisdom? That's what he said right there. Asking it shall be given. You seek and ye shall find. Well, I want to find it. I need wisdom. We're to seek truth from God so we can be molded into the image of Christ. Proverbs 23, 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. It's something so valuable you never want to get rid of it. You never want to get rid of it. You'd never sell it. Some of us, you know, maybe we've heard a family member has some old thing. We find out, man, that thing's worth like eight grand. I mean, it's a family heirloom or whatever. We're like, man, if I had that, I'd sell it. I'd sell it. That thing would be gone. I'm Craigslist, here it is, wherever. I'm calling up, you know, Antiques Roadshow, where are you at? I'm stopping in. I want to get rid of this thing. You know, I'd sell it in a heartbeat. But the Bible says about truth, we're to buy truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. It says we're to buy those things. It's going to cost us something. Hmm, that's interesting. It's going to cost us something. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. We have to seek truth from God so we can be molded into the image of Christ. It'll cost us less if we buy truth and wisdom, knowledge, understanding, instruction, because we'll avoid the pitfalls. See, if you study through the book of Proverbs, there's something, a principle it teaches time and time throughout the book of Proverbs. And it's, it's this truth that there's really two paths. Okay, the way of the fool and the way of the wise. And the simple person standing in the middle. And she's, which way am I going to go? Am I going to go after the wise? Am I going to go after the fool? That's what it is right there. And we have a choice what we're going to make, what we're going to do. Are we going to go after the fool or after the wise? We're going to buy one or we're going to buy the other. We're going to buy into one or the other. Which one's it going to be? We have to make a decision about what we're going to do, which way we're going to follow. Are we going to buy the truth and sell it not? That's what we have to do. We have to make that decision for ourselves. In John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we continue in His word, we're His disciples indeed. And after that, once we continue in His word, then we'll know the truth. See, that's what we have to do. We have to continue in what we know. Continue in what God's showing us. Are we seeking after truth? If He says, Seek and ye shall find. So if we're continuing in His Word, God says, you're going to know the truth. And we're to buy the truth and sell it not. It's that precious. It's that important. So in the book of Proverbs, which one do we want to be? Do we want to be going after the foolish way or, or the wise way? I forget which side was what. Or the foolish way. Which one? Those are the options right there. You're picking one or the other. And the wise person is going to look at the... What the fool has done, I forget which side was the fool. The wise person is going to look at what the fool has done and learn from that. And say, I'm not doing that. See, you don't have to learn everything by your own experience. Look at the fool and say, man, that was dumb. I am not doing that. I mean, that's smart to do. That's wise. But a fool sees a fool do it and says, I'm going to try the same thing. I'll, I can do it. I can get away with it. I can, I can bypass the principles in God's Word and get away with it. And you'll be surprised how many, I mean, adults do stuff like that. 
Christians that, that have been in church for 20 years and they go against the principles of the Word of God and it still ends in disaster for them, but they think they can beat it. And here's the danger in it because you might get away with it for 10 years. So you think, I'm doing okay. It frustrates me to no end when I see parents of, of young children, I mean two, three years old, and because at two and three years old, you know, you can control them. But they want to just be like half in and half out with Christianity. And they're just like playing this game with it. And they think it's okay. Because, well, my, they're, they're young and they do what I say. But if they'll just look down the road 10, 15 years, they just ruin their children. They ruined and destroyed their children. Yet I understand that by the grace of God, anybody can get saved. But typically those ones who grew up partway in church and partway out, don't. They come to despise the things of God. And they say it's a joke. That's a fraud. It's fake. I want nothing to do with that. That's typically what happens. Not always, but like probably I've never done a hard study, but I would say like 95% of the time that's what happens with those kids. But it starts right back here when they're young, when they're one, two, three, four years old. And the inconsistency there. You're just you're training them to hate God. And over here is when it's revealed. When the reality of what you did back there is revealed. And people don't want to look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about that the, the we need to be hey, faithful, we need to be consistent. We need like... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, we need to teach these things in our home, model them, I mean live them out. That's what it talks about when in, in Deuteronomy when it says that they're to have the Word of God on their head and on their hands. And the Jews took that literal and they put these phylacteries, we learned about that in Sunday school, this, this big old thing with the Word of God in it. That's not really what he was talking about. He was talking about let it be in your mind, let it be in the things that you do, live it out. Live your Christianity out so your children see that it's real. But they don't get it. They don't do that. And they're living like a fool because they think they can escape the principles of God's word. They're fools. But they're not going to realize it until they're down here. And their kids are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And rebellious as can be, cussing them out. I mean, as bad as it gets, that's what's going to happen. And they're going to say, what did we do? What went wrong? We raised them in church. No, you didn't. You told them that anything else that comes up is more important than God. But the, the, look, that's what it means when it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Because I've talked to those parents on this end over here. So we raised our kids in church. No, you did not. You taught them that anything and everything is more important than God. We'll fit God in if we can. And it's a joke. It's fake. That's the way of the fool. We could choose that way. Or we can learn from what the Bible says. Don't do those things. Don't live like that. And follow the way of the wise. You don't have to experience all that disaster. Follow the way of the wise and just listen to what God says. Trust Him. See, continue in my word. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do you know what horrible bondage it would be? Look, say, you're, say you are saved, and you're living that half in, half out way, and you know the Lord is your Savior. Do you know what bondage and misery it would be to be down here and know that your actions way over here caused your children to hate God, to despise the Lord? Do you know what bondage that's going to be for you? See, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, there's liberty in truth. There's liberty in that. There's liberty in the bounds that God's word sets. It's like, I can run around anywhere in here where God says it's safe. I can do whatever I want within here. Praise God for that. It doesn't mean there's liberty in sin. And that's what so many want. They want liberty and sin. They want to follow after the way of a fool. But God says, hey, are you seeking after truth? 
That's what will mold us into the image of Christ and make us like Christ. Like Christ. God will open doors if we knock on them. If we would real quickly turn to Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. This is to the, one of the letters to the seven churches. This is to the church in Philadelphia. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. He says, I know thy works and I've set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. God will open doors if we knock on them. All three of these actions that we just looked at, asking, seeking, knocking, all of them are actions. It implies you have to do something. You have to ask. You've got to say something. You have to seek. You have to go knock. That means you have to be at the right door. You have to be where God's led you. You have to follow that path of wisdom. And God says, here's the door I want you at. This is where I want you. Knock on it now. And he says, I'll open it for you. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. But look, you can't just, you have to have God lead you to that right door. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Well, knock on what? He says, the doors I've put before you. He says, I've set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. Maybe, did you ever think about maybe they got to the right door and they were knocking? And God opened it up. He said, no man can shut that. Go through. That's for you. See, that's where, where it comes into us following God's will every day. Every day. People ask, well, I want to know what God's will for my life is. Well, are you obeying what you know to do? Are you doing the things you ought to do? Are you in His church? Are you spending time in prayer and reading? Bible study? Are you spending time sharing the gospel with people? I mean, do what you know you should be doing. That's God's will for you. That's it. It's not some like mysterious mystery that, that nobody knows and it's like, oh, I hope this cloud of God's will falls on me one day and I just, whoa, oh, I got it now. No, it's not like that. It's me just following Him day after day, doing what He's told me, obeying Him, walking, him, walking in truth. And then God begins to reveal, open doors. That's really how it works. I mean, just the door opens and you go through it. Amen. That's how it's worked in my life and everything that I've done since I got saved. When I started teaching uh, the children, when I started teaching an adult Sunday school class, when I started uh, teaching the teens and running a bus route and doing all these things to the point where I started a church, I mean, that was a lot bigger step, but it was still the same path that I went down. I was still obeying God, doing the things that God wanted me to do. And then I started, began praying about it, asking, seeking, knocking. God, what do you want me to do? What is it? What is it? Lord, I, I want to start a church. Lord, do you want me to start a church? Can I start a church? And what are you going to have me do, Lord? And I was like, God, please, will you let me know? Will you let me know, please? And he opened the door. And he said, there it is. Go through it. Go through it. That's how God works. His will isn't some mystery. It's just do what you know you're supposed to do, and He'll reveal the steps to you. That's why I take us back off into, I think it's Psalm 119.89, thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lamp doesn't lighten a lot. If you've ever been out in the camping or something in the woods, a lantern, it just kind of shows you about, you know, like a six-foot radius around you. That's about it. If you want to see the rest, you've got to take a step. And another step, and it just keeps lighting it. That's God's word. That's how we're to follow it. So God will open doors if we knock on them. But it requires our action. We have to be at the right door. We have to go to the door. Don't expect God to do for you if you won't do your part. Don't expect it. Let's ask God to open doors for us that no man can shut. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Paul, on one of his missionary journeys here, Acts chapter 16, verse 6, says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, see, the Holy Ghost said, no, you're not going to preach the word in Asia. That's where they wanted to go. The Holy Ghost said, no, you're not going to Asia. Verse 7, after they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. They wanted to go into Bithynia now, and the Spirit said, nope, you're not going in there. I'm not going to allow you to go in there either. Verse 8, and they passing by Messiah came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. 
And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. God had an open door for them that no man could shut. And by the way, they later did go into Asia and take the gospel. That's the letters to the seven churches. They did go in there. Paul did go into that place. But God says, not yet. It's not time now. No, you're not going there. Don't go there. Don't go there. And we, and we talk about getting this church plant going. And right, my prayer is the war zone right now. That's where I feel like the Lord would lead us. But if God says, no, I'm not going to allow you to go there. That's not where I want you to go. Then guess what? We're not going to say, well, God doesn't want to start churches. We're done. No, we're going to pick another area. And we're going to say, how about this one, Lord? You want us here? Can we go here? And if he says, no, then we're okay. Well, how about this area? We're not going to get discouraged. We're not going to quit. We're going to go till God says, that's it. That's the open door. Because that's where God's hand of blessing will be. And who knows if five years from the time we start this one, he might say, now it's time for this area. Now I've sufficiently prepared it. Now. You can go in there. But we want an open door. That's why I'm asking us to start praying now. Asking. Seeking. Knocking. So we get to that door. And he says, oh no, it's not this door. Go to that one right there. It's that one a little bit farther down. That's the door I'm going to open for you. We, oh, okay. That's it. That's where he's leading. Not here. Okay, that's what we need. Ask and you shall find. Or ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. We need to ask, seek, and knock. Let's pray. Father.